Hey guys, we know the topic of this show is another UFO show, and we want you to know that we're not going down a UFO track with this show. This was just a great opportunity for us to interview Tom Reed about his story in the Berkshires UFO case, and for us to talk to you about our interviewing technique, why we ask questions the way we did, and to analyze Tom's body language. We hope you'll enjoy it as much as we did. And if you look in the notes about the show, you'll find all of the things we reference in our introductions about projects we're working on, websites to us, ways to find our books. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time. Tigers first. Well, yeah, now you know they're easy to get. All we got to do is call Tom. And listen, you just them. somebody comes up and they go, "Do you want a tiger cub?" And you go, yeah, sure. "Why not?" What the hell? Yeah. Like, what is it <laughs> that would would cause somebody not to realize that they grow much bigger? I no, would I'm never really buy one if I could rent it and just give it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give it back. And yeah, sure. There's but your business. What is, what is it about somebody that go doesn't recognize it will get so much bigger and it's a predator? Yeah, there, there's the problem. It has teeth the size of your fingers. Right. And you are in the food chain. Yeah. I'm, like I, a pet just, shark in my pool, please. Right. I just obviously go, so it's, it's, it's that size now. And I, my mind instantly goes, okay, it'll get a lot bigger. Yeah, I'm not interested. That somebody would look at this thing and just go, that will remain the same forever. I, I don't get oh, that mentality. Cute. Oh, how cute. Yeah. 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 Don't get it. All right. So you ready? Yeah. All right. Here we go. All right. Well, today we're going to go back and we're going to look again at some of the things we did with uh, Tom Reed from uh, the uh, Netflix special, The Berkshires UFO. And what we did was we, we, we just watched him. And we ask him questions. We didn't go in and say, oh, is he being truthful? Is he being deceptive? Whatever. We we're sort of showing the people who are watching who are interested in that, how we go about doing that and getting information from someone. So now what we'll do is we'll go back through some of these uh, sections of it where we saw interesting things happening afterwards. And we'll talk about what we're seeing there. Let's talk about, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about memory and bias. Greg, why don't you talk about that for a second? Yeah, Chase, you've got a lot of stuff around bias. Well, the one thing to remember is the way we are successful in life is by finding patterns. Our brains are fantastic pattern finders. And the way your brain operates is every time you run electricity through those circuits, that circuit gets more and more pronounced. And so one of the biggest problems you have in the intelligence world, and Chase and I can talk forever and, and bore you to death with intelligence cycle, but one of the biggest problems you have is failure in the analyst side because they can't imagine that something is possible. When we had 9-11 happen, nobody believed that was a handful of guys who worked this thing out, got into the U.S. and had that much success. The same thing has happened generation after generation because we can't imagine that something's possible. The role of a good interrogator is not to judge, not to figure out whether it's true, well, to figure out whether it's true and you believe what the person's telling you, but not to figure out what it means. The analyst's role is to figure out what it means. Analysts work very tightly with indicators, and those indicators mean something. And so they jump to conclusions and they constantly have to be have those conclusions addressed and you have to take away that bias that they built in. You do it every day in life. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is when we train people to interrogate outside the United States and other cultures, they typically spend two years learning a foreign language with natives of that foreign language to learn not to think like themselves and to, and to project onto people from that culture, but to better understand how the culture works. It's a very important part of what we do in trying to suspend all of that bias, whether confirmation or other. And Chase, I'll pitch it over to you to talk for a minute about some of those biases. Sure. So one, I think that we see when we're watching a body language video or watching some, anything on YouTube is something called the bandwagon effect. And this is, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off the bridge too? So we're, we're more likely to do what the other primates in our tribe are doing. And the next one is confirmation bias. This happens especially true with politics. And if you think of Apple versus Android, this is confirmation. Or what's another word for this is choice support bias. They're technically two different ones. But if I've picked an Apple phone, I'm more likely to see fault in the Android user's phone. And if I have an Android, I'm more likely to see fault in an, an Apple phone and see the good things about my own. And confirmation bias is pretty similar. But confirmation bias is something that makes us only seek out things that agree with our own opinion. 
We only click on the political headlines that demonize the people we don't like or the ones that champion the ones that were our, our personal favorite. Another thing that this can really have a negative effect on, especially as us or you watching some of these debates coming up, if I'm a Trump supporter, I'm more likely to see deceptive behavior in Joe Biden. All humans have bias. We are none of us without bias. If I love Joe Biden and I hate Trump, Trump will look like a monster no matter how good he does on stage. My brain is more likely to default to the negative side of things with Trump and more likely to champion and see the positive indicators of Biden. And I'll talk about one more bias I think is really important, and this is called bias bias. This means that a person believes that their bias is so low that they're not biased at all, which in itself is a bias. And that leads us to a final discussion really quick here called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the Dunning-Kruger effect states that the less information someone has, the more likely they are to assert that they have a, a wealth of knowledge on the subject. And one of my famous quotes on, on the internet now is, there's no one more certain than the guy who read three articles online. And that is a, a good example of what the Dunning-Kruger effect is. I've, I've read a body language book. I'm going to go on LinkedIn and update my status to a body language expert. So we see Dunning-Kruger in a lot of different ways. But I wanted to bring that up before this video because I had a lot of beliefs going into it. And I have to process that internally. There's no vaccination against any of these biases. You can't go to a doctor's office and get a shot and get rid of this stuff. It's built into our brain. However, knowing that it exists and going into an interview or going into a, a video analysis, knowing that the bias might be present and knowing that I might have some bias towards A or B is important to getting rid of it or mitigating some of that. And I also wanna talk a little bit about memory before we jump into this, because we talked to Tom quite a bit about his memories, and this happened a long time ago. And I'll tell you one fact about memory that's pretty interesting that I thought was interesting. Every time that you touch a memory, if you access any memory from your life, you edit that memory permanently. So if I think of a birthday party, and then I, I think, well, yeah, I think I got a bike that year. The next time I think about it, I, I might think, yeah, I remember getting that bike. And then it, it's a false memory. That's how easily false memories can be created. And if you want to watch a great talk about this, there's a woman named Elizabeth Loftus who has a fabulous TED Talk about how easy it is for people to create false memories, especially in groups where all of the group is coming from a same narrative. And, that, and I thought that might play a part in this. And that was something that I was aware of before we started talking to Tom. And that's Chase, all. One, one last note I would add to that before we hand this to Mark. It's not just that you edit it. You edit it with your current schema, with the way your brain works now. So you have the 40-year-old memory and you're adjusting a nine-year-old's memory. That's the problem with stories that are this old and that have been told over this many times and managed between a family. So we need to say that up front. Mark, sorry. We step a little bit on you for, let's talk about bias. So let me just add this one thing. Our brain is not a knowledge machine. It's a best guess machine. As, as, as Greg was saying, it's making predictions based on patterns. It can't make a prediction if it's never seen that pattern before. And on the whole, if it's never seen a pattern before, it doesn't default to positives, it defaults to negatives. So it'll tend to have a negative bias, usually around confusion, when it hasn't got anything to predict off of. And when it gets confused, it tends to dig pretty deep in the unconscious and often what many people have called the collective unconscious, some of the very, very old stories that we have deep inside us that we've inherited over millennia. So often when we see something that we can't make a quick prediction of, we go very, very deep inside ourselves to come up with the answer the prediction. What do we think that thing is? I just wanted to say that because it, it may be useful as we go through this interview with Tom, having some understanding of, of that possibility. Scott, I'll hand over to you. 
Excellent. All right. Well, I'll let you all have covered pretty much all of it. So why don't we move on and we'll go uh, right to our first video. <clears throat> and right here, what we're, gonna, what we're gonna see is the part where we're baselining Tom. And we're, we're watching him. Greg is, a, Greg is the one that's gonna ask him questions. We talked about how to approach this before we started. So Greg would ask questions, become friendly with him, and have him talk about his childhood and some things that happened, then specifically get on one thing. So as he's remembering something, we're gonna get a look at how the things the body language he uses as he's actually remembering something that we know is true and that we know is habit. So th that's what we're going to be seeing. And as we go along, we'll compare what we saw then to what we're seeing as the videos go along. So that's what's going to be happening. So let's take a look at our first video. Well, I, uh, I grew up in the Berkshires, Southern Berkshires um, until I was about, um, about uh, 18 years old. Um, my mother had a diner in town, which um, is now renowned in the, in the area. And I grew up with horses, and uh, I, uh, funny thing is, when I had the horses, I wanted a dirt bike or a mini bike, and then I ended up getting a dirt bike, and I wanted the horses back, so <laughs> it's never a greener on the other side. You know, Tom, you and I share the horse thing we said yesterday. Yeah. It's, the only problem with the horse is they eat when you're sleeping, you know? That's, that's right, exactly. Right. So, so tell um, me about your, yeah, so was that a horse when this thing happened to you? Tell me a little bit about that horse. Let folks get to know who you are and what you did with your horse and that kind of stuff. Just oh, make when, I, when I almost fell? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I was riding um, at a horse show, a 4-H horse show in uh, Great Barrington, which is uh, was held at uh, Ski Butternut. And uh, yeah, I was um, probably, uh, I was nine. And uh, we were using a, a horse that I wasn't used to riding. It was a, a larger horse. And um, when I put the saddle on it, apparently it was gassy or whatever. So the stomach was a little bigger than normal. And uh, I was in a competition and I was going full speed. I, mean, I had a thing in a full gallop. And all of a sudden, the saddle started to slide to the, you know, off to the side of the horse. I'm grabbing the mane because I'm like, this, you know, I couldn't even stop the horse. And uh, there must have been 20 or 30 other horses. And I was somewhat up front, you know, the better part of it. And, um, yeah, by, by the time um, I just felt these hands grab me and, and slide it back up and took me out of the, out of the race, um, you know, that, that was why we left Ski Butternut and started heading home that night that we, we saw this. Uh, we were involved in what we were. And, um, yeah, that uh, scared me quite a bit. I w didn't go on a horse for a while after that. I mean, I was actually shook up from that. But uh, so uh, with, with what um, happened back in, in Sheffield, I I wanted a camera. My mother was like, what do you want for you know, your birthday or Christmas or whatever it was? And um, I told her I wanted a camera. And um, because if we ever saw this thing again, I was going to get a picture of it. And so my mother got me one of those little Polaroids. We had to wait three minutes, and you pulled the thing out, and you watched it, you know. Um, you rip the paper off of it and da-da. And, uh, and so that was kind of what, believe it or not, um, fueled my career because I got into the photography club in Great Barrington mm -hmm. High School, and then I started shooting Fashion Runway in Hartford, and then um, I became a stage manager for uh, Northeast Concerts, and I was working with some bands, uh, John Kay from Steppenwolf, and, um, and then I started shooting for Sage Allen Fashion Shows. You know, Sage Allen, you know, uh, was a store of that in, in the New England area. And um, I met uh, Daniel Gallo, who was uh, with Penthouse Form in New York City. And I was trained on uh, slide film and studio lighting. And uh, so then I went to Miami and, you know, and over uh, probably about five or six years of shooting for other agencies, I opened up my own agency and it was quite successful. And I had the five-year packaging campaign for Love's Diapers. And I was working on a lot of uh, staffing a lot of the um, – girls and TV shows like CSI Miami and I became a the, one of the booking agents for the Miami Dolphins and had season tickets to that. So Miami was kind of more my home than anywhere else until uh, about 2006 when um, I decided to uh, get a fresh start and, and move over to uh, the Tennessee area, which to me was more of a, a warmer New England. So it kind of felt more at home and that's kind of why I'm here. That's the baseline. That's, that's what we're going to use from this moment on to start comparing to what, to what we're seeing. And in this case, what we're seeing is uh, when he first begins, you pay attention to, you've always heard, well, that shoulder shrug, the one shoulder, that means they're lying. They're not telling the truth. That's what the absolutist will tell you, that it shows deception. Well, we're seeing him fire that thing off with almost every word he says, and we know what he's telling us is true. So that automatically knocks that out of the way. So when we see that, we can go ahead and say, ah, oh, that doesn't mean much. His illustrators, they're really big. They're going off. They're, they're his, he's uh, Mark's truth plane. You can't see it because the, as, as the, at the angle he's sitting. 
but he's he's gesturing specifically with, and he's using both hands a lot of times. And when he, when he sees something, he'll go and he'll look at it as he's telling you about it. So, we, but Greg and Chase will get into the, the eye movement part of it, your eye accessing. We're looking at that. Also, one thing to 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 listen for is the way he talks here at the top. He's talking. He's talking at good volume because he's happy. He's proud. He just. He just met. He's just meeting us really and seeing us in, for the first time. We're getting to know him, and he's proud a bit about being a kid and the things he's done. He's talking about his horse. I mean, he's, he had great memories, and and it's important that he me- remembered things as a child. So you can go back and we get a look at him when he's remembering something from when he was a little kid. So you when you go back and listen to this again, listen to not only how he's saying things saying things and what he's saying things but listen to the tone of his voice it's very strong it's up front it's it's loud it's it's right there right there on you you don't hear you'll hear as it goes along you hear the volume gets get lower and you hear the tone of his voice and by the tone i mean the timbre is more uh, you'll notice when greg is asking him questions greg doesn't talk usually greg's like well i'll do this and that but when you notice the way we talk to him We've all got little smiles on our faces and our voices are kind of like this when we talk to him and they're, they're very pleasant and our voices are doing this because we're trying to keep him in a good mood. And so, so nothing will change. We want to keep the, the, the vibe pleasant. So it's good for him. So he remains happy. So that's the, so listen to our voices and, and watch how we act as well as we go through this, but really pay attention to Greg because by this time, you know how he acts and you know how he sounds. So you're actually seeing him engaged in an interrogation and trying to get information from someone and as he's presenting himself in this fashion, it's a lot different than when he's sitting here talking to you about what's about what we're watching. So Chase, what do you got? It's going to be the new title of the show. I think <laughs> what is that was, the top, that was the top comment on the, uh, on the YouTube video. I think oh, Mark, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Make a great t-shirt. Yeah. What do you got Chase? Or a cup. <laughs> Chase, what do you got? Uh, so we see that repetitive shrugging. That's great. We also see a lot of body narration, which is my whatever to describe it. He's talking about grabbing onto the horse. He's talking about flinging off. He's talking about hands grabbing him. So all of this, his body is helping to narrate the story. We also see him in a natural state. He looks up into his left to access these memories from childhood. And that's one of the things that Greg was doing there. What does it look like when this man remembers something from that point of time in his life? And next, we'll also see a long use of permissive language, sort of, kind of, you know. So asking for permission from Greg, to he wants Greg to keep nodding as he's telling the story. And we also see that his pronouns are self-driven. I, 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 my, me, I remember, I felt this. And that was it. I'm going to give it as fast as I possibly could. And that's it. Greg? Yeah. So what I noticed is when things are, they're a handful of things. His choice of words, like you said, is kind of folksy and whatever he has gotten away with his whole life. I do the same thing. But he, while he's using pronouns like I and we, the minute he gets something happening to him, he goes to passive voice. Did you notice that? Go back and this thing. When something has happened to him, I was grabbed, not someone grabbed me. He goes to passive every time. And you'll hear that throughout this when it feels like he has been in some way victimized by this whole thing. He talks about going through the bridge and coming out the other side and everything changed. He's not talking about the atmosphere. He's talking about the world changed that day when he says that kind of thing. So pay attention to his passive voice. The other one, we talk about him moving his shoulder. Part of that is him moving his shoulder. Part of it is, and I, I like where you talk about body narration. I call this illustrating. And part of that is him illustrating with his left hand as his elbow is lying on the chair arm and it's causing his, his shoulder to rise. So pay attention. That's not just baseline. That's mechanics at some point. The other one to start noticing when he's talking about something he did personally, he narrates with his right hand. Have you noticed that? Pay attention. When he goes to both hands, it's something big that happened or when he's talking about someone else doing something, his left hand is narrating. So it's an interesting shift from what you see in most people because most people use one hand or the other. Um, And then finally, you watch as we go through this thing, 
you're right, Scott. I'm trying not to be my usual direct, hard-ass question, excuse my English, my direct question. I'm asking in a very different way. In fact, when I want to cut him off, I ask a leading question. You'll notice. I say, did you, will you, are you? Those are not good questions to get information. They're good questions to direct conversation. And that's interrogation 101. And we'll stop there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So what I want you to notice is how he leans his uh, head on his hands and he's using all of his fingers to support that head. And he's very, very comfortable in this situation because he's telling a story that he's excited by as well. And that's partly why you get the, this kind of shoulder shimmy that happens. It's both shoulders going up and down. He's quite elated by this. And you see some true smile. You see some, some, some real kind of excitement about it. And, and his head is fully supported. What I want you to watch is, is further down the line as the questions become a little more tricky for him to answer, he becomes more stressed this finger falls away. Now, this is quite hard to do because I now have to bring my head off a little bit so I don't hurt my fingers. And this muscle here is under stress, which may mean I'm trying to show you that I'm still relaxed, but actually I'm not that relaxed anymore because the, I'm now having to put in some extra muscle activity. So watch out for, for that one. Uh, yeah, I, I totally concur with what everybody's being said. Massive illustrators there of being grabbed off the horse. So he's a big physical storyteller, uh, especially when it's a story that has happened to him. So big physical movements there. Um, what I also want you to to know from this is that he makes the um, this moment a defining moment of his life. He says, I got a camera specifically so I'd be able to photograph this thing again if it showed up. And that altered the rest of my life. And that's why I, I became a, a fashion photographer and worked with, uh, you know, in Miami. And this thing, he says, was a defining moment in his life. So he frames how important the story is in this first moment. That's all I got. Excellent. All right, wonderful. Everybody good? Good. Right, let's move on. Oh, now in this next one, let's pay attention to, from what we just saw, from what we all just explained, let's pay attention to how things have changed. Once he starts being asked, Greg starts asking him questions. Let's pay attention to, again, his voice. Let's pay attention to the volume of his voice. Let's pay, pay attention to his illustrators. Everything as we're going along, pay attention to how things change. And his hand as well. Because at some point in this, he's going to start, his whole hand goes on his head when the, when the emotion starts, starts building in this. Ooh, near a telephone pole. And how, how far do you think she drove? Oh, maybe uh, 30 yards, 40 yards to the clearing, just the other side of the tree. Did you hear anything? No, I didn't hear anything. Any burning scent, smell, anything else? No, nothing. It was, it, it was quiet. I mean, we, matter of fact, it was almost dead quiet. It was almost too quiet. Okay. I didn't hear anything. You know, I mean, it was like, I mentioned it was like being underwater. It was just like muffled. And, uh, and you would have thought you would have heard something. You would have heard birds. You would have heard something. Nothing. I mean, it was dead silent. And I could, I was looking at this thing while it was dead silent and it was just like and as crazy as it sounds it seems like once we came out the other side of that bridge things were changed i mean the atmosphere the everything was just different just were you like, all talking to each other during this while while that weird I, I feeling really was remember. happening to be honest with you i don't remember but i'm sure we were because it was hot the windows were open uh, my brother was sitting next to me it was late i almost got trampled i had a uh, a green ribbon and a brown ribbon, which I was pretty upset about. And, uh, and so I'm sure we were, but it, we were also tired. Um, I, I can't really remember, but I can't imagine we weren't, you know. Uh, All right, Greg. Yeah, so this one, there's nothing really, really big. This is a nine-year-old memory that's been, and Tom will tell you and did tell us that he has backfilled many of the details because they've been sharing the story between his family for 50 years. So there are going to be a couple of things in here that normally I would be very aggressive with questioning, and I'll point those out when we get to them. But in this, when he's saying everything was different, he's not talking specifically about the space around it. He's talking about the entire thing, about how this whole thing worked. When he's uncertain about how we're perceiving him, he's got a very nervous smirk. 
pay attention to that because he does that because he knows that he's talking to us. This is a, into now we're starting to ask hard questions. We're starting to ask questions that give him an opportunity to tell us a fact. If you noticed, and Chase, you hit this dead on earlier, his left eye accessing cue as he's recalling his story. Okay, we expect that from rote memory, just like we saw in Bob Lazar when he was on Rogan. When you see the eyes moving to the left for rote memory, that's one thing. But when you ask him a question about how far did you drive, I bet that question's not been asked in that fashion before, and he accesses left memory as well. Whether the memory is accurate, whether the memory is something that he has touched 50 times in 50 years and is tainted, different story, but he's not deceptive. He's not masking. He's not covering. His body language now has slowed down. They're no longer these big sweeping movements. He's moving into a more emotional state and into a more, he's telling us a story that he knows that we're going to be on top of. So he starts to slow down his body language. In fact, his cadence of speech has slowed if you pay attention. He's not big and boisterous. He's now slowing down. I don't see deception. What I see is a story he's told before, maybe edited many times, and he's going to tell us something later that you may or may not expect, that he didn't think he was abducted by aliens. And this piece is important that you pay attention to what's changing in him because he's telling you what he recalls or remembers. That's well, it. That's what do you got? So, uh, yeah, as I was saying earlier on, um, when there's confusion, we often go quite deep down. I want you to understand he's already started using this image of the bridge and one side of the bridge and the other side of the bridge and on the other side of the bridge, it's a different world. We're not in Kansas anymore on that other side of the bridge. Everything has changed. What do we have underneath the bridge? Often underneath bridges in folklore, we have trolls. We have things that other entities that are from dark places that will mess up our life, that will stop us getting from one side of the bridge to the other side of the bridge, developing ourselves. And so I, I want you to look out for that. Um, image. Also look out for that he says that he almost got trampled in that first part of the story. Okay. There is a, essentially a near death, potentially a near death experience. The sense of my life was, was almost ended before this transformation event even happened. I also want you to pay attention to the, the brown ribbon. Yeah, you got a, uh, I think a green ribbon, as my understanding is sixth place. Brown ribbon puts him at eighth place. These are low places. And so he's disappointed around these placements. He's, he's now at a socially low point um, of acceptance and uh, wishes to make a transition to a better place. Not very much there about nonverbal. It's more about the themes that are already starting to play out in this story, which I would say comes from confusion and may help us understand what's really happening in that child's mind and maybe now this adult's mind and why the story may be constructed as it's constructed. I'll leave it there. Chase, what do you got? Uh, when, when we're talking about going through that bridge, that's one of the only times in this video you'll see him specifically use his left hand to gesture. And there's going to be another one, and we'll talk about that when it comes up. And the visual recall at 30 yards, uh, Greg nailed it. And I think he used body narration again when he's talking about the upward glance at, the, at this thing. He's talking about looking up, his eyes move upward, not as a recall, but as he's looking at something from his memory, I think there was truthful recall where about his brother's position in the car, same exact eye access and cue. Uh, there's a wonderful body narration about holding the ribbons with his fingers. He's holding those little brown and green ribbons there. I thought that was great. And when Scott asked a wonderful question there, did you hear anything? Was there, were you guys talking in the car? His eyes look ahead but they kind of move back and forth. And this is called the trans-derivational search with, with eye movement. And that was a genuine attempt at recalling some sounds in the car. And you'll see later in this video that he does have some issues with auditory memory, but his visual memories are a lot more clear and concise. And that's all I got. Scott? 
Excellent. Here again, let's, um, and I want to put it back on us, listen to the tone of, to Greg's tone of voice and to my tone of voice, because again, this is how I usually talk. When I'm talking to him, my voice is up a little bit. It's a little bit smoother, a little bit softer. And again, those are on purpose to keep him, try to keep him in that state of relaxation and everything's cool. We're just asking him questions and trying to get to, to what happened. You'll see here also at the beginning of it, when he gets excited, his illustrators start getting big. Then he starts calming down and his voice gets quieter. And, his, and the, we're sort of at a medium point here on his excitement level as we go along. So his, his illustrators start getting smaller and lower. And then uh, his, his tone of voice changes a little bit. It gets a little bit softer toward the end because now we're starting to get in a little bit more and just a little bit more into the emotional part of things for him. So that's when we start seeing, seeing things begin to change a whole lot. Um, and that's all I got. And one, so, other, one other technique that uh, Scott did there was borrow a shirt from Willie Nelson's 1987 uh, cross-country tour, which is a fantastic interrogation technique that not a lot of people talk about. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> We've got yes, this thing going on back and forth. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Did you leave the car, or were you in the car the whole time? Well, no, I stayed in the car. I mean, as far as I know, um, it was uh, it was a powerful night, man. Um, but uh, we were pretty shaken about, uh, for, for a long time, we were very shaken about that, you know. But I also have weird memories of um, – you know, that night of things that I saw or, or recall or which are very difficult to talk about. I don't talk about it for a lot of reasons. I try to stay very palatable. Um, but uh, there were a lot of things that we came back with that night. I do remember being in what looked like a large um, uh, open area, like a Walmart, if you were empty at a Walmart, you know, just empty. Um, big open area, which was much larger than what we saw. And that's why I say to people, you know, people say to me, you know, uh, were you, were you on a craft? I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I was. I mean, I, I've never said that I was, um, I was somewhere. We were extracted from the vehicle. All four of us were remember different clips and moments or fragmented memory of what happened. Um, but, um, you know, we, uh, we don't know where we were. Um, a lot of time went by when we found ourselves back in the vehicle my grandmother was now in the driver's seat. The car was off. We didn't shut the car off. When my mother stopped that car, it was running and the lights were on. You know, we didn't, she never shut the car off. We just sat there and looked at this thing. It was running. And um, so my grandmother found herself in the driver's seat. She goes down a dirt road. She turned around and went back to town because we're only a mile from town where our house was about seven miles from there. And she went back for help. And we had no idea, or she at the time had no idea how much time had passed. And so she went into silks when she got out of the car. Um, she believes the car door slammed, which woke me, which was something else. We all came to at different times. You know, I was the second one to wake up from this thing. My brother's head was on my leg. Um, my mother was out. She wasn't responding. So I followed my grandmother into silks. We went in the front door. She went right past the, the clerk. And, um, and she, went to the back of the, she went right back to the back of the store and got like caught up in these bikes and strollers and things that were in there. I'm grabbing her hand saying, Nana, Nana, I remember that. And, um, the, the clerk, you know, was looking at my grandmother. She stopped for a minute. I don't remember everything, but, but, um, she never really asked for help for anything. And we went back outside. My mother was standing in front of the car. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So this really is in kind of pieces all over the place. He starts off with, um, I stayed in the car as far as I know. So it's almost a setup to go, so I, I'm, I maybe didn't stay in the car and maybe you're going to leave it at that or maybe we're going to open up to go into another story, which happens because we say nothing, we go quiet and he goes, but, but, and then he says, well, I, I don't talk about these things. And then he starts talking about these things. So either we're really good, and just by staying quiet, he spills the beans, or this is maybe the routine of, I don't normally tell people this stuff. Oh, go on then, I'll tell you. So I think we go into uh, a, a bit of a set story here, 
which is the, the idea of, I don't normally tell people this stuff, but I'm going to tell you this stuff. And it's very jumbled at, at this point. It really is a mashup of lots of data. And it means it's very hard to question this story because it's hard to work out who's asleep at what point and, and, and what, like, hang on, I thought you woke up over the other side of the bridge, but you seem to wake up a bit, a bit later. There, are too, there is too much jumble in here to really go into it and go, what exactly happened here? And I think there's a, a certain purposefulness to this idea. It's tough now to get into this story. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at I'll leave it at that. All right. Here's what I think. Now, have it, <clears throat> with what you just said, Mark, I think this is, and tell me if I'm right about this, Chase, or not. I think that's where Chase said, ah, because when he asks his questions at the end, they start right there, where he says uh, he, doesn't want to, he doesn't want to talk about it. He's not going to talk about him. It's, a lot of things happen that night. That's, that's a bunch of information he's holding right there. And then from then on, the reason it looks so jumbled because he's running those scenarios in his head that he's remembering as he's telling the rest of the things that went on because he's trying to get away from that. And I think, am I right, Chase? Is that what you saw? Yeah, I, I saw that exact moment right there, and I said, I want that. Okay. I that's, want, that's I want to get that out. Chase, that okay. was a, I'm going to say that was a beautiful loop back because we got him almost there, and I tried, and it was too soon. But you did a fantastic job of re-anchoring, bringing him back in, and looping him at the end to get that information. Oh. That yeah, it really felt to me like he's protecting the real story with – a protection of the real story. He's fainting. He's feigning yep. that yeah. here's the real story that I never tell anybody in order to protect from actually telling us the real story. Yeah, because he almost goofed up there. And th so that's what I think, because when Chase comes back with his, and starts his theme at the end, comes back to that and starts with it, but we'll get into that. He, it was yep. played beautifully. I mean, beautiful. It was, beautiful. 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 Yeah, really nice, really nice. Now, another thing is when he says, my grandmother found herself, in the driver's seat. That means that's a cue that says he didn't, that was told to him. That's what she said. Because exactly. what happened here? And he's heard her say that. Obviously, she's not around anymore. But obviously, he's heard her talk about that a lot. So that's when he says he found herself in that. Then it was we went into the drugstore and she went past. I think he may have followed her in there, but I don't think he went with her. That's the vibe I got. But then again, that may be the way he's remembering, remembering that as well. You'll see at this, at this point, you'll see his whole hand go on his head. I believe this is the one, if I remember correctly, as he's rubbing his head. Because the more emotional he gets, the more that hand gets, the palm of his hand gets close to his head. I'm sure Chase has got something on that too because it's dealing with hands. But uh, his, his illustrators get less for a while. He gets really still. Am I ruining all your stuff, Chase? Am I taking it all? Oh, sorry, man. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? He's got something in his hands. Oh, no, no, no. You've always got your, your whole hand thing freaks me out from the time we, we talked about the uh, when we were talking about hiding uh, um, arteries and things like that, you know, which is one thing you look oh, for yeah. when someone puts their chin down. But the other things when we talk about specifics, yeah, when you get into fight or flight. But anyway, um, and I could be wrong, but I think that's I, I would think that's where you're going to go with that, because I thought about you and I saw I said, hey, he's going to go right for that. Um, so he's, and he's sitting fairly, he gets fairly still because he's way in there. He's way deep remembering things and trying to work out what he's going to say. So back to the beginning of that, I think, I think Chase saw that first part and grabbed it and said, okay, I'm going to put that right here and I'm going to come back to that thing here in just a little while. Sat there and patted on it. It was nice to it and all that. Because when we get to the end, what Chase did, which, which we'll go over, then uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a key moment in this whole thing. So Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so there's an interesting shift. In the beginning, he's talking in facts. Here, he actually says these words, I saw or I recall. That's a powerful statement because what he's saying is, I've touched this memory, to our point earlier, Chase, about editing. I've touched this memory dozens of times in the 50 years, and I've told this story. Mark, to your point, it's a routine he gets into so that he can talk about things in a certain way. If I were in an interrogation instead of an interview, I would have been very harsh and said, how the hell did you know what happened about who woke up where? Because you were asleep and nobody knew but your grandmother. But I know what his response would have been because I've talked to Tom. By the way, guys, Tom is a great guy, good guy to talk to. You get a lot of information out of him. He's, he's forthcoming with whatever you want to talk about. And he had told me, well, my story has a lot of my grandmother's memories and my mother's memories for that matter and my little brother. 
And so I didn't go after that and say, how would you know that she was in the seat? How would you know that she drove you or asleep? If I were investigating a crime, I probably would be a little more aggressive. To your point, Mark, this is a different kind of divulging information. He denies the UFO. He's trying to put things in rational terms that his brain can understand. He says, I never was abducted by aliens. Never said I was. This is not that. This is something else. He does a lot of we in this one. He's starting to do diluted memory and shared story because this has been told so many times. When he gets to the maybe, he smirks a little. And there's one point I try to cut him off, Mark. I'm sure you noticed when he was talking about tangling up in the bikes, I was like, okay, that's a visual. That's his redirect. And I tried to stop him, but he kept going through it. Um, I just, the, he does get emotional. His eyes don't drift down right, but his head is drifting down into the right and he's getting smaller as you notice him. So he's telling us what he remembers and he's even telling us, this is what I recall. I saw or recall. And so I don't see deception. I see him doing what he always does in his storytelling. And that's that. Excellent. Chase, Chase what do you got? So we had, uh, there's a, a phrase that stood out to me here. He said, I came back with a few things when he's referring to the memories. I thought that was noteworthy and unusual. I don't think it was deceptive, but I think it's very unusual. I came back with a lot of things came back with not. I remember, or I, I specifically recall someone trying to bullshit shoot you and, and lie to you is going to say, I specifically remember this. I, I distinctly remember seeing X, Y, and Z. Like we like you've seen other people that we've analyzed on our channel have that same exact thing. My, my memory is crystal clear. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, there were some deceptive behaviors, but not a, a very big cluster of them. He said, I remember I stayed in the car as far as I know, which is called an exclusion statement in, in most deception training, which is okay. Then it was followed by immediate facial touching, mouth covering, and hygienic lip licking. So we did see a little uh, a cover there. So I think he knew that statement was factually inaccurate. And it was followed by something that was just a pause and is something, I don't know what the name is for it. I call it a regret breather. So I think it was a moment of regret that he said, you know, I, I stayed in the car. Like Mark said, he was probably, there's a story here. He's a producer. He makes films and stuff. So he's setting it up. And he makes a shift to team pronouns. And I think if you watch the whole interview, if you go back and watch the whole two hour deal, he shifts to team pronouns anytime A, there's a group memory, or B, the event is socially unpalatable. So it might be unacceptable socially. He's a very socially driven person based on other people's, all of his language is social. Uh, flawless body narration and recall when he's looking up at his grandmother, kind of reaching his hand up. I thought that was uh, very indicative of truth there. Looks upward to her. And if he is, I'll give you a, a quick tip here. If someone's lying to you, they're more likely to want to help you to understand locations. And when he says this place called Silks, he doesn't say, well, there's a grocery store in the town that's uh, 12, 12 blocks east of wherever, and it's called Silks, and it's this grocery store, and that's where we were. He doesn't care. He says, we we're, we're drive straight up to Silks, and I thought that spoke to a, a little bit more of his genuine nature there. But he just he's okay with just saying the name of the store. That's all I got. Excellent. All right. Everybody good? Mm-hmm. Let's move on. So when you were in these rooms, you felt something grab your arm. Did you see anything, any person, any kind of a person in that entire time? Yeah, I saw <laughs> I saw something quite disturbing, you know. Um, so I, you know, I don't know why. Yeah, um, it uh, looked like a bug or an ant to me with a, a large football-shaped head, which is not something I talk too much about because, you know, there's no point. Well, and I, I think the way your memory works at that age, you're going to remember things a certain way for sure. But as much as you're willing to share with us there, we're certainly willing to listen, and I appreciate it, Tom. I know that could be disturbing. Yeah, all right. I, I saw something that looked uh, – it wasn't human. You know, and I've said to myself, well, was it robotic? Was it 
Was it, um, you know, um, genetically engineered? Is it, you know, we've had a lot of species on the planet. I keep saying we've got 8 million species. What's in one, 8 million and one? You know, I've tried to justify what we saw. I've tried to play with it. I've tried to make sense of it. I've struggled with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I saw something that um, was quite troubling. Was it tall, short? Yeah. I mean, it was like four and a half, five feet tall. I mean, it was bigger than me. Um, it looked like a bug. It had a head like a football, and it had um, stick-like legs like bamboo. When I was in Florida, I, you know, we had uh, you know some bamboo, and I was like, oh, that's what the legs look like to me. And uh, I've had it sketched, and I've, it hangs in Roswell, but um, I certainly avoid talking about that because it's probably the, the only thing I cannot actually you know, validate in some way. And, and, um, and then again, you know, we thought, well, maybe, you know, there were magnetic anomalies, maybe, you know, with our vehicle, maybe there was some, our neurons in our head were affected. You know, I, I struggle with why I remember these things, why I saw these things. All right, Chase, what do you got? So we're seeing mostly truth here, according to me. I think uh, there's genuine recall. There's no stiffness in his body here. And there was some head shaking there. And, I, and when he starts talking about what he's seen, the, I think the head shaking was dismissive uh, due to his worry about the social implications of what he was saying. And I think that's where it came from. And you can see it if you play this video back. You can see when he says, I saw something quite troubling. You'll see the sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle right here in the neck, which is a – I call a fear muscle. This is one of the first things in the facial expression of fear. This jumps in front of your carotid artery. Uh, you'll see that that neck muscle start to move when he says something quite troubling. I thought that was a great micro expression. I don't know what the heck to call it. Something to spot there in the video. Greg? Yeah, so there's one place in this entire interview where I was a little concerned, and it's when he started to talk about seeing something. His eyes dart to his right. And usually he's an access left, access left, access left, access left. So why is he going right? Of all the things we talked about with him, this is the one that seems by my bias to be most outlandish, that he saw something that he can't explain. Now he's nine. When I was nine, I might have seen a suit of some kind that I thought was that hanging on a wall. So who knows? And I even give him that. And I minimize a little bit that maybe your imagination was running wild, but he doesn't go for that. He doesn't go and say, you're right, maybe it was my imagination. He says, no, this is what I saw, which usually people are not emphatically going to tell you something that they're making up once you give them that out. Now, given it's been 50 years and he's got a picture hanging in Roswell and, 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 different story. Then when he gets to, he starts to talk about a little bit of his theory, you see that nervous smirk again, the nervous smirk about how he's going to be received by us. Because to now we've been friendly and we're, you know, like I said, great guy, we liked him, we talked to him. But he's got that nervous smirk, and that's who he is. It's kind of a nervous, amused smile. Otherwise, I, I'm with you. Chase, I think I see mostly truth here. Um, it's all memory that's been tainted and touched and all that over the years, and I'm not taking anything away from whatever Tom saw. He is telling us what he believes to be true is what I think here. And that's where we have a, a, a strong distinction between deception and inaccurate. That's right. I, 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 that's, that's something we yep. should say just for the – the flame spray comments. Yeah, and guys, I'll go all the way back. I, I knew two people, one who said he saw UFO and I knew he was lying to me and he didn't have any details and that kind of thing. And another guy who had seen a UFO that turned out to be a street sweeper and he was drunk. I mean, that's that guy had factual stuff and really believed he had seen a, a UFO, but he was a drunk driving on the road and saw a street sweeper. Two different things. One's trying to be deceptive. The other's telling you the truth as he recalls it. Excellent. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so to follow up on the points made there and, and the idea of truth around this, I'm seeing really relaxed breathing throughout this. So he's pretty relaxed telling us about some some odd stuff. And I think there is some – this is where it gets way more complex, I think. The complexity level goes up because this this half smile that we see, okay, is it is it a – uh, a half smile of of slight fear, you know, socially, what are we going to make make of this? There's potentially in my mind that it's a half smile of I'm getting to a really good bit here. And I like this bit. This is the bit where I do the bugs. 
yeah and 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 he's working up to that moment i, I I'm unsure. What I do know is there's complexity in the face there that makes somebody who's, who's you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a human being, so we're designed to read each other at an unconscious level relatively accurately for our own safety. And so when we look at another human being and go, yeah, I don't get it. What's going on there? Then there's a level of complexity going on there. It's, there's something not sorted out quite in the mind as, as to a definition of where's this person going with this. Okay, I want, I want to leave another couple of things with you. There's a lot of species on the planet. So again, this theme is going to come, come back again. I think there's something underlying the whole story that is, that is story arc that is created here and the idea of there's a lot of animals on the planet. I'll come to, back to that. Um, two eyebrow raises when he says, I, I had it sketched yeah, and it hangs in Roswell. Now this is super important because this same picture, he did a picture uh, along with other kids at school and the kid, and the pictures were put up. His was a very different picture from all the other pictures that kids made. He was an outlier artist at school. And now he's got a picture of his hanging in Roswell, which means he, it's canon ufology. So he's moved from child outsider artist to canon he's in the museum and this is really important for him as some i would say as somebody who got a brown ribbon and a green ribbon and now he has got first prize because his picture of the bug is up in roswell i'll leave that one there so what you've been saying so far mark is this is the count of monte cristo got it exactly <laughs> All right. Well, this is, I think in this case is the first time we actually see uh, what is almost, if it, if it isn't eye blocking, when his hand comes around, he starts this, when he gets into the de getting into more details of, of the bug. And I think that's because not because he's, he's um, afraid of it, but he's saying stuff he knows again, socially, as Mark was saying, is not going to be accepted. When you run around and start talking about something, a bug as big as you are or bigger than you are, that's doing stuff to you that starts to get a little bit out there. It starts to get a little bit odd. So I think in this case, um, that, that's the first time we're actually seeing close to uh, eye blocking because, boy, he gets right in there. Uh, as well, we're seeing him slow down. He gets even more still as he goes along. So I think that's, some, that's, that's an important thing to pay attention to. And then his voice, again, begins to go straight. Instead of all these jumpy things everywhere, it's like this. as he starts telling what it is. And things start going as he speaks, go at a down at the end of it, these kind of things. Not like end of it, that kind of thing. We're doing this, it's down this way, all the, 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 those types of things. So I think, again, he's focusing and trying to remember what he saw. Now, remember, and I, he's, he's older than me. I'm 57, and he's a bit older than me. I don't remember what I was in the fourth grade. I, I really don't. I mean, I remember my teacher was Miss Butterini. Hand to God, that was her name. Wonderful woman. And I remember some of my friends from there, but I don't remember – the specifics of all that. So a lot of this has to be built in from things he re may remember portions of, but then built up as we go over time. When you talk about the top where you start adding things to, to your, to your story. So I, I, at this point though, I'm, I'm not seeing a whole lot of things where he's consciously telling us something that, that didn't happen. If it didn't happen, I think that, that with this story, as it goes along, there are chunks missing and then he will fill in those chunks with things but I think he believes he, he saw that he saw the bug or the, the, the bug thing. I'm, I'm more than on that. And now let me, let me take you another route and, and I think to tie it all together. It doesn't matter if he saw it or not, if he believes he saw it. I mean, right. whatever it is, right. If you, if I saw at nine years old, some kind of suit that looked like a bug hanging on a wall, let's assume he ended up somewhere other. He never says he was in a UFO. He says he was in a building and, now, his mother was very direct. She saw a <coughs> spacecraft of some kind, a craft. She called it a, a ship. He never says it's exactly that. He called it a craft or something. Like that. He never says that he was in, and you can cut this out, Scott, but he never says he's in a UFO. He never says that. And he never says that these things did anything with him. They were there. So what if it's a suit? What if it's something and he was, you know, they trespassed? Who knows? 
But whatever it is, he remembers something and he's adding over the years, adding details back. But this is his story. Nobody else is here but him at this point. So it's going to be a nine-year-old's memory touched over and over and over by a 30, 40, 50, 60-year-old man. And one thing you'll notice, just for, just as a quick tip for you who are listening, not giving each other advice again, <laughs> but one thing you'll notice that Greg does, Scott does, Mark does, and that I do towards the end of the video, the first time I start speaking to Tom, is as we ask a question and, and Tom starts talking, once he gets on a roll, Scott, Greg, Mark, and me cover our mouths while we're listening to let him know, and that's kind of a nonverbal permission for him to keep speaking and continue speaking. So when the, in the days of Zoom meetings, that's something we can do on business meetings when we're talking to other people on Zoom, and we'd like to hear more information while they're talking. Regulator or, mod, you call it a moderator, Mark? Moderator, yeah. Yeah. All right, everybody good? Good. Let's move on. Do you remember the color of the of those of the bug? Do you remember what color it was? Yeah, it was how like, many colors was it? It was like a, a mushroom color with a like a orangey head. So the football shape, it was like this this way, or was it like this way, like a sideways? Football? Like you're holding a football. It was just like you know, uh, uh, and the head was bigger than a football. Um, so the points came out here on the end like that? It would go like this or it would go like the this? The neck and the stem went up the middle of it, and it had very stick-like arms and legs, and the body of it kind of came to a like a, like a teardrop. And uh, that's what I remember. Did it communicate so they, in any way? Talk it, to you? No, no. I just saw it. I saw two of them, actually. They were facing a wall. Their heads were almost into the wall. Did they move? Did they have eyes? Or what did their eyes look like? Like round, just round like uh, marbles. So let me let me just get this straight. So if it's a football, was it like this or was it like uh, this? No, like, like the tip. Like the mouth would have been at the tip and the, and the eyes. So it's sideways, in other words, like straight on football. Not not point not point up here and point up here, but points on the side. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, like if I was holding the football like, like this, going to throw yeah. you the ball, the face would have been right there. Oh, okay, I got you. The, like I said, this is the one area that I, I struggle with because it's like I so it's not the it's, it's not, not the big almond shaped eyes or anything like that. Just no, no, no. What did their hands look like? Did you see those? You know, I've I've tried to fill in some things that what I might what it might have looked like. So, to be honest with you, I I don't really remember a lot of detail. I remember the, the fear of it. I remember sketching it. I remember I. I drew it and hung up, hung on my class. I'm sorry, on a chalkboard in one of the classes I was in in fourth grade, and a lot of other kids were drawing stuff too, and mine was the only one that, you know, was a of something very different, you know. Um, no and, sound. It didn't make a sound, or did it make a sound? No. Nope. <laughs> I don't remember that. You know, there's my brother seems to think that there was a rhythmic feeling, something like that. Um, I don't really remember that too much, but um, then again, we've all collectively talked about this our whole lives. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things. I, we, my brother remembers, like I do, being on a table somewhere, but we don't talk about that either because it sounds so freaking, you know, tabloid. So, Here's where we're seeing, uh, we see stress mouth here as well. When he starts getting into the details of that, when somebody, some people call it lip compression where their your lips go away, he'll do it really quickly because he's saying things he doesn't, that he's afraid, again, socially, are going to make him sound kind of odd. The reason I kept asking about the head, because I wanted him to go from the, and the eyes and the shape, I wanted him to go from the head and start describing it all the way down, but I couldn't quite get there. Then I made, I, I, I kind of goofed up here. I, when I said, um, um, what, what did you hear any sound? What the, I should have, what I should have said was, and Greg and I, Greg's talked me down off of this already, but I should have said, what did you hear? But I didn't. I said, did it make a sound? Versus, yeah. It's just a leading question versus the other. I don't think it hurt. It. Story. Yeah. Well, I was trying to, I was trying to keep him in, in this area so he could start describing this and work his way down, but I couldn't quite get in there because he's, I think what we're seeing there a lot of times is fear in that situation. I mean, that's the first time I actually saw fear on him 
was when he was doing that and, and insecurity as well when he, when he began talking about that. And because he got very, he got really still, he would use his hands, but he wasn't, he wasn't moving a lot and his volume sometimes would, would pop out a little bit and get a little bit louder. But that's, I think he was actually reliving some of that and that, that, there was fear in there. So I was trying to get him to tell me about the eyes when I said, was it the, the classic almond shaped eyes? He got loud. I said, no, no, it's nothing like that. He doesn't want to group himself in with all these people who yeah. claim to have seen bugs and UFOs or whatever it is, the classic grays. He's trying to stay, to stay away from that and be the, and, and because his is separate from that. That's another reason that, that, that I believe I'm, we're seeing uh, him being truthful here is be, because of that, because he's, he's definitely saying, I'm not one of those. That's not what I, that's not me, man. I'm not doing that. So I think a lot of things we're seeing are, are him trying to separate himself from that. That's why he, the information we got at the end of this, when we stopped recording was, was, was a, a lot more, but that's why I think he's trying to separate himself from, um, from all these, I don't want to say people who aren't telling the truth, but these, these other stories, because he believes what he saw was true. was real. So Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think you mean the other stories that society might deem as less credible mm-hmm. on, on a general scale. So when Scott is asking whether or not he looked like Stewie Griffin. I almost said that, man. Hand to God. I almost said, because I, I remember the episode where he was a football head. I almost went there, but I didn't. So, and he describes the color as mushroom which I thought was interesting. Uh, I've never heard anyone use that term. Maybe he's been hanging out at the Home Depot paint aisle. <laughs> I, I don't know. Or set it creative <laughs> colors. Uh, so there was repetition of head touching. I think this is his go-to self-soothing behavior here. Uh, for anybody who plays poker with uh, Tom, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, so there's more worry about social implications here, I think, than anything else. This is his second time expressing a lack of auditory memory. And when he's talking about laying on a table, it's the second time that we see him deliberately pick up his left hand, unconsciously pick up his left hand and use that specifically for a gesture. And that's called gestural hemispheric tendency in my book. Or someone's positive on one side, and they typically gesture negative with the other side. And the other time he used this uh, was when he talked about the bridge, and that's all I've got. I'll pass it off to Mark. Yeah, lovely. So just as you're saying that, Chase, we we see this um, comfort, but the finger now taken away. So I would say he's now under quite a bit of stress around getting this story about the bug specifically uh, across and we're seeing lots of kind of what I would say kind of bobbly movement I mean the movement is now all over the place there isn't that relaxation we had in that last question relaxation of breathing relaxation of movement it, it's way more jerky and and pointed so so it's up on this one I would say uh, yeah we see that um, side of the mouth come up in a lip compressor what is it? Is it fears, fears he's made a mistake around talking about this or, or the specific color around it? Or, uh, or he, does he not like where this question is going? Again, I'm not sure, but it's maybe something of those two. It, certainly this is going to an uncomfortable place for him. Um, he says, I've, I've tried to fill in some things. He talks about fear here very specifically, and yet further down the line, there isn't any fear, and his mum says, well, there wasn't any fear. But earlier on in his story, way before that, he was almost trampled to death. And I'm thinking maybe there'd certainly be some fear there. So, so questions start to arise in my mind at this point about how some fear in that event may have been sublimated into something else, projected into something else. Again, I don't know, but that's, that's where my mind starts thinking as a, as a possibility. So for me, there's a couple of things here that make me more concerned than anything I've seen. I, I, Chase, you're dead on. You call it hemispheric, but I have said to you early in this one, if you notice when he's in control, he's using his right hand and he is punctuating the right things with his right hand. 
And when he is, when he loses control to your point, he illustrates with his left hand that one time when he's talking about being on the table, that's, that shows loss of control to his baseline. If it were not for that, if it were not for him showing those two different pieces, I would be all over three words would have been when you said, where were his eyes? They would have been on the front on this part of the football. They were is the way I would expect a person to answer that question. Now, that means conjecture. That means it feels like he's creating something in his head. Body language is supporting. Words are a little wonky for me. And I probably should have gone, hold on a second. But I didn't. I didn't push deep into that point. And I could see he was starting to get a little nervous around the poking and prodding. So regardless, if he saw something, whatever it was, whatever he's filled into his own memory, this is the one place I have concern in the entire story is that he saw some bug. And he's sharing with us something that is very important for him to share. But that's the only thing, those three words versus the body language that is just everything we've seen up until now. There's a little bit of adapting there. Could that be because they're facing the wall? Yeah, it would have been. Of course, the next question is how do you, how do you know if, if they're facing the wall what their eyes look like? That would have been another good follow-up that we didn't do. I mean, I didn't. None of us did. But – Candidly, the would have been, maybe it could be, maybe it could be that he's saying, well, it would have been here because their head was facing the wall. But that, that's usually, a, for you listening, that's a red flag. When somebody's describing something, they say would have been. It is a speech pattern in some cultures. I mean, a lot of New Yorkers talk that way, and he is a New Yorker. You know, New Yorkers, I'm working in a place 15 years. That's not a normal speech pattern outside New York, but he's normal in New York. So, yeah, Chase, that's a good call out. It could be that. But he is certainly illustrating with his right hand, except for when he loses control again, then his left hand comes up. So yeah, it supports everything except for those three words. Excellent. All right, here we go. Let's move on to the next. This is the last one coming up. You know, the hurdles we've had to overcome, you know, but it's made up for a strong family. You know, we've got a very strong family. Would imagine. So Tom, yeah. Tom if, I would imagine it's an emotional soup that whole night. What, what would you tell me you felt like throughout the night? I mean, I, I doubt you had one feeling, but if you had one, that's okay too. What did you feel like that night? Inspired in some respects. Um, you know, I, I remember just being completely still and just, you know, um, awestruck I don't remember feeling sick or happy I just emotionless maybe just kind of um, kind of like my God you know I mean that's what it was like Um, I wasn't scared of anything Um, maybe I was too too young to be scared I don't know but I wasn't scared at all I um, I was more uh, intrigued um I uh, I remember I remember seeing a thing just kind of stay still, and then moved and look for one. You know, it actually I, re- I remember at one point lowering, um, but uh, I mean it was it was it was like a bubble. You know, if you like in a little bubble as a kid, you know. Those little bubbles, it sort of looked like a bubble with a light. It was like, like a two watt bulb and it was solid. It was like a sphere. And this is the thing, too. It didn't like bleed light off the, the, the piece itself. It was like, almost like if you, if you had a perfectly round light bulb and, and it was just bright and intense and self contained. You know, like if it was looking at it. You could almost look like a moon, if you know what I mean. Not that it's given off light, that it's just self-contained that way. I mean, I've, you know, there's, I've thought back and gone, yeah, it could have looked like a moon, you know. Um, All right, who wants to go first? I, I, and I'm much on this one. This is a 60-year-old remembering a 9-year-old's memories because no 9-year-old is sitting in awe. Right. This is he's edited it many times and he has gone back and thought of what he what he saw. It, I would imagine that if this happened to an average person, never mind a nine year old, you'd be pretty scared. You would think, what's that? I mean, the what's that? Oh, yeah, you would get. He works on this up in his memory here. 
And he starts to say things that kind of trail off like he's lost concentration throughout this as he's trying to describe. And I think in part, Scott, it's because we're poking on his story and we're asking questions he's not had to consider. I'll get, I won't guarantee you because that's awfully arrogant and awfully biased, but I would expect very few people have asked him, how did you feel? What did you smell? What Everybody asked him, what did he hear maybe, but what did you smell? What did you hear? That kind of stuff causes you to have to go access something. We've asked him to talk about feelings here, and he's avoiding feelings a lot, if you notice. He's going, in fact, into other senses to get away from feelings. I expected to try to get him down right. And Chase, this is in large part prepping for what you do later to him, because if you can get him in feelings, you've got control of that next setup. And he just didn't go into feelings, if you notice. So that makes me wonder what, now Mark, what is the feeling he's trying to stay away from? Fair? Mark? Yeah. Um, so the family had a lot of hurdles, and I think what, what, is, what has come out of this is an inspirational story. Um, there's this idea of scared, not scared, um, asking for compliance on, you know, he's a great visual storyteller. He's telling us he could, he could have, could have looked like the moon. He's kind of running out of juice now of his, of his usual story to be able to get his, his handle, uh, on this. I think what he's done here and maybe I'm jumping to a conclusion here, really, rather than analyzing this moment. But but he's developed um, he's developed a a big story here in order to explain uh, something that was quite complex. I imagine around around the horse or around some other fear element. He's created something to deal with that complexity. Um, and, and he goes on later to talk, not in this clip, but to talk about Tom's monument, uh, to talk about arcs, to talk about saving species. Often th th that, that big Noah arc story is really a story about what do we do when things get really, really hard and everything's out of control. We kind of wipe the slate clean and start again and get to another side of a bridge and it's time to start again with this stuff. I, I think he's, he's created a, a big story here in order to deal with the complexity of something as a, as a nine-year-old. And so at this point, being asked the feeling of it it's, it's so much deeper and so much more complex that, that he, he can't really express the feelings that were there. I mean, I'm jumping way ahead here, but there's, there's my piece on it. Chase? We hear him use three adjectives here. This is strong, inspired, and awestruck. And we continue to see him twice here. He says he didn't feel scared. So I think uh, the, the two things that, that govern a lot of his social decisions, am I going to confess to a crime? Am I going to talk about something? Is based on what are the social implications and will it make me look weak? So we see this theme start to play itself out. And I think when he says he wasn't scared here, because earlier he says, I remember the fear. And then here he says, I wasn't scared at all. Granted, we didn't ask him the question, but I think that he wasn't scared at all in response to while he was in the car looking at the craft, because that's the situation that we're asking him about specifically. So I think there is mostly truth here. And throughout the whole video, there's mostly truth. We can do our percentages after uh, Scott's thing. Okay. Yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm with you there. I am seeing fear on him, though. So I believe he was afraid, and maybe he's, as an adult, saying it was he wasn't afraid, or as, as he looks back on it, it doesn't scare him now. But I think when he was a little kid, if that happened to him, I think we, we saw fear. However he relived that, if it was for whatever reason, I think he, he went through some something happened to him, and I think he's being honest about that. And, and I give his being honest in all this and his truthful – thing on a, on a zero, you know, to hundred percent, I'm going to give him, I'm going to give him about a 90. Greg, what are you going to give him? 
Yeah, you know, I, I, when you say afraid, Chase and I are both military guys, and I always love hearing people's war stories, and there's never the part about how afraid they were. <laughs> I always laugh at that because, in fact, we all know exactly how you felt during that. It takes a certain amount of fortitude to be able to talk about emotions with people. So I'm going to give him 85 to 90%. I, I don't see a lot of deception in his body language. What he is recalling, and he says what I recall, not what I saw, what he's recalling is what he tells us. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think, I think he's a very credible witness to the idea of, of, of what he feels a child saw. I think he finds it hard to access the feelings around, around that. I think he creates a very, very grand narrative around that, one that is, is seen throughout history. Um, and, and I think there are some underlying um, there's some underlying psychology that here that pushes him towards creating a grand narrative, something absolutely monumental that will let us know um, that he was here and, and something, and he was part of something inspirational. Uh, and, and along those lines, I see somebody with, with uh, integrity to that story and, and also wondering whether, worried that it might be a bit too tabloid, a bit too extreme, worried that they may not be believed. Uh, it's quite, you know, I think, I think it's quite a complex situation here. And I think that's what I grapple with is, is, is the depth and complexity of what's going on here and the age range, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, we've got a child talking here and, and an older man telling that story of, of the child. It, it really is quite complex. That's the best, that's the best way I can explain it at this point. What do you give him on a, on a zero to a hundred percent being truthful? What do you give him? Yeah. Like 80. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chase? I mean, you know, there's some honesty and it could have, could have been the, you know, what does he say? It might've been the moon or it, it you know, it, it, it could have been something. I mean, again, some classic images. It could have been the reflections from the moon. This is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the worry is lunacy when the moon comes out and, and, and that light hits our eyes, uh, visions, appear and this is something that has been throughout art throughout poetry uh it's a classic well I, I'll, I'll say this if i were not to suspend disbelief i would go a very different route i would say okay just because you remember something doesn't make it true and i'm saying he's being truthful to what he's in, in his body language and in what he's yeah. saying to us chase same with Greg. I'm going to go with an 86.784% of truth. Let me write that down. <laughs> yeah, because I thought you were going to give 86.7. Hand to God, I thought most, you were 87. That's the most decimal places so, you've ever done. Yeah, okay. So, Chase, tell us what happened. So, we see this repetitive need for socializing situations. We see a need for strength here. And in interrogations, there's a there's a 50-step process. There's a 10-step process. Depends on who you ask. And Nine steps. <laughs> who your instructor is. But there's four things that are very important. Socialize, minimize, rationalize, and project. Those four things are pretty much in every interrogation system in the world. So I tried to do that in less than 20 seconds on uh, camera here while we had them here. The first thing I did was to socialize the situation and make it okay. I said millions of people are, are doing this for others, and you're doing this for others. You're helping other people. It helps to push his narrative. That's the reason that he's telling himself that he's doing this stuff. I'm emphasizing his strength. I talk about this takes a lot of balls to come on this show. Not a lot of people would do this, come up against four profilers. I even minimized myself by saying the first time I talked to Greg, I was – it's super nervous, which is actually true. So then I asked, start asking, when you were nine, did the horses treat you differently? And he goes, wow, that was a really good question. 
He wants his mommy to come into the room. And I'm not saying that, saying this to make fun of him, but I'm asking him a question to deliberately bring him back to childhood. I have his mother in the room, which is something I have never had the pleasure of enjoying in an interrogation. And then, you know, there's a break. His mom comes on, comes back. So I've got to push him back down into childhood again. So he, he has that kind of protective thing about his mom. He doesn't want four behavior profilers ripping his mom apart, which is understandable. I would have been a lot closer to the camera than him if you guys were talking to my mom. I'd be at your house, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then I have to regress him again. So I regress him again back to childhood by asking, were there some people that you were really close with? Who were the closest friends that you had? There were some people. And all, with my hands, as I'm going to the past, I'm moving my hands this way, which from a left to right timeline is backwards for me. But I'm moving them this way as I'm talking about the past to help him visualize, help him go back to that direction. And then when I say people dismissed you, I'm moving my hand away from both of us. I'm not pointing at him or me. It's somebody else. That's not me. I'm not dismissing you. And then uh, I, I say the words open up as I'm pointing to myself. If you can just open up. And then when he starts talking, I cover my mouth like Scott, Greg, and Mark also did to allow him some room uh, to speak. And then I say, I re-socialize it at the very end saying lots of people saw this. There are tons of witnesses to this. The governor's even confirmed it to make him more and more comfortable to talk. And the reason I wanted him to regress just a little bit is what are we when we're kids? Well, what are we when we're kids with animals? We're connected, we're open, and we're vulnerable. So I wanted to jam some electricity into that part of his brain to begin with. And then finally, we go with the great technique from the read interrogation technique, which is called direct positive confrontation, which is basically when I say I've been doing this a long time. And if I'm in an interrogation room, I might say, Scott, I've been doing this a long time. If there's one thing I know, it's when I'm not getting the full story. And that would be a direct positive confrontation. So that's a couple of the things I use. There's about 50 more that were snuck in there. But those, those are some of the big broad strokes of, of how we got him to say, okay, I'll talk about this, but you got to shut the camera off. So having said that, we told Tom that we weren't going to show what he was going to tell us, that we quit recording. But we kept recording. And now we're going to show you what he told us, the rest of that. And it is mind-blowing. You all ready? was just as crazy just like once we hey guys we did promise tom we would not share what he told us what he told us did not take anything away from his story and in fact supported the things he had told us before we're not going to share that with you but it was not fundamental to changing the story